my dad joke and they're gonna think it's probably a bad joke but i'm gonna tell my dad joke anyway and they groaned at Nobbin way so i guess we'll hear a collective groan here as well but i'm gonna tell it anyway because it's on the screen and i can't get past it without you seeing it so it's got to go so you ready huh all right i mean i like last week's i don't know if you remember last week's i liked last week's kathy didn't think so but i liked it here it is oh tail too busy uh, guess what time it is? What time the man went to the dentist? Tooth hurdy. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Ah. Okay, don't worry. I got more. They're going to get better. Maybe. Maybe. Hey, I know. Dad jokes hall of shame. <laughs> I, I, if you guys aren't nice, I'm going to leave it up there and make you keep looking at it. <laughs> okay, uh, enough of that. Um time. I wonder if I should edit this. I'll edit this a little bit here. Um, last last September, I was fortunate enough to go to a conference at a worship conference, which was really good in Orlando at the Magic Kingdom. Uh, stayed at the room was at the Contemporary Resort Hotel, and it was just like oh, this is you know it's not it's not the Lazy Apple, put it that way. <laughs> Zeke's hunting camp and. It's not that at all, Zeke, so don't worry. You know, they're never going to look like the Lazy Apple. Don't worry about that. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I go in there, and I, I get there, and Kayla's coming up from Saint Sarasota to meet me there, and I'm going to the desk to check in, and there's this, there's this line of people checking in. I mean, it's just like this desk is like 100 yards. I mean, it's not 100 yards, but it's long, okay? It's really big. And so I, I get through there, and I come to the counter. This lady comes to greet me, you know, give me a Mickey Mouse-like smile, and they're really nice. And, and I was, I'm leery. When I go to a place like that, I'm leery, you know. I go, I'd like go like this. <laughs> you know what that means, don't you? Hold on to your wallet because she ain't cheap. <laughs> they didn't put this counter in here cheap. Like. Anyway, so I went there to check myself in, and the lady asks me a question. She, uh, she says, do you want a magic band? And naturally, I said, a what? <laughs> she says, a magic band. A magic band. I said, well, what's that? Probably not, though, because <laughs> I knew she was out to get more money. I understand Disney World, all right? And I was thinking, you know, I was, I was thinking, I was thinking, she just wants to give me more money. And she went to tell me that this band would have my credit card attached to it, and it also would be a room key. And, it went, and I went, wait, wait a minute, go back to the credit card thing. <laughs> And, and she told me how that I'd be able to go all over the Magic Kingdom, use a magic band, and I just didn't have to worry about carrying money with me and this and that. It'd be so much more. And she wanted to extol the virtues of the magic band and telling me everything I could have. And then she says that Kayla, coming up from Sarasota, from Bay of Vista Mennonite Church, and wants to be there with her, she would be on my account, too. I'm thinking she's been on my account all her life. <laughs> what changed? <laughs> so, so she, she's she's oh, she said be made on my account. It'd be easier just to get around. And I'm thinking, of course it is, lady. And she's making a sales pitch. Wants to get money out of my pocket and this and that. So, of course, I I I made the decision and I knew what I was going to tell her. I said, sure, sign me up. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then she said, we'll put a limit on how much. You, you can do what what she didn't know that the credit card would limit me anyway, <laughs> so it didn't matter you know she thinks she's limiting me with that credit card company they got they got it on on Disney anyway, so she said just a, just a few moments here, just a minute, and she walks in this back room and she comes out Jeff, you've been there recently you, 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 you know you know the drill, and so she goes in the back room, she comes out, and then she tells me other things that I would like to know and and other things about Disney and this and that, you know, and I've been there like a dozen times, 15 times. I don't know how many times I've been to Disney in my life, you know, and, and, and you know, when you go to Florida, as often as my family went to Florida when I was a little kid, you would go there sometimes just for a day or whatever. And so, I, you know, she tells me all this thing. So after everything I want to know, so after that painful moment of her telling me all this stuff, enduring that pain, I mean, I just, I thought, she must know I'm a Christian by the way I'm acting through this, all this. <laughs> you know, I must. Anyway, so um, 
she went, she went to the back room, and she comes out again, and she has this sleeve here. And it's got this, it has this band on it. It has a band for me and Kayla. If you can see, my name's on top, and Kayla's name's printed there. And it says Magic Band, so it's not something I'm making up. And our names are printed on this cardboard thing. And I'm looking at this, and go, wow, they printed our names on there. You know, I mean, I'm thinking that you would have a whole pile of these in the back without anybody's name on it and use it. And then I get my band, and I look, and my name's on the inside. Here's my Magic Band. My name is, and they let me keep it, and I'm going to keep it anyway, you know. And what I paid for this band is, and so my name is on the inside of the band, so I don't mix it up with Kayla. Like, it matters. She's on my account anyway, you know. But you can use these as a room key and get in, and the idea is that you can go around the Magic Kingdom and not feel like it's costing you anything. You just spread your hair around. Just and it's a cha-ching, a cha-ching. And, you know, people buy into this. They, they take this, and they, it's all great. It's all wonderful. They make you feel special. That's the idea. And Walt Disney, his idea of Disney World was to get people to come and leave home behind and spend time here at Disney and not think about home and just enjoy everything, and everything's wonderful. Then when you get home, 30 days later, you get the bill in the mail, and then you, then you have a heart attack, and you have to go see the doctor, and everything. No, no. Anyway, and th- that's what happens. And that's what happens to people. We get caught up in the excitement of now. We get caught up in what's now and, 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 and that type of thing. I'm going to change gears a little bit. I want you to track with me. Follow this line of thinking, if you will. Suppose, I, uh, suppose that I was able to um, you give you a choice of living in a country the capital city of any country and in le- this special country the capital city that you would choose you could choose one of two countries and and, and this capital city would be like disney world magic kingdom just great right so you can live in either city but you the deal is you have to live by the prevailing principles of that city you can't go and change anything this is how we do things. Kind of like when I moved up here. No, Tim, this is how we do things here. Well, well we didn't do that way in Goshen. <laughs> you know? and, and so you move to this new city, and this is how you do it. You live by the prevailing principles of that city. So we're going to call, for example, we're going to call the first city, New City. Now, you'll have a, a new city. You have a person who's ruling, ruling the city. This person's very good. This person can be trusted implicitly. But the deal is to live in a new city, you have to follow this person's guidance to live there. Anyone can live in a new city. Anyone can have a citizenship there. The ruler opened the door so anyone can come in. It doesn't matter. There's no borders. There's, no, there's nothing to keep anyone out. But to live there is going to cost you your independence and your self-rule. It means you have to give those things up. You have to give in to the leadership of this person. The promise is, though, you'll always have everything you need. You can live there. Now, let's let's think about these cities, okay? Or you can live in the second city. And if you're old enough, I don't mean second city TV. The pre-Saturday Night Live. I I remember that. Some some people remember those things. Anyway, um, and we'll call this second city, we'll call this free city. Free city. So you have new city. We have free city. The rules here are different. Here, everyone gets to work together. Everyone gets to decide how they're going to, how their lives will be shaped, what we will do. You get to keep your independence, and you get to do as you want. There's a lot of freedom here. And instead of having one person being the governing, ruling body, saying this is what we're going to do, you're going to have, and this person, the ruler is at the center of the life of the city, you're going to have the free city. There's no ruler at the center. In fact, everyone living there sees themselves as the center of their lives, and they worry about themselves, take care of themselves, do as they want. Anybody can live in either one of these cities. But the main difference is if you live in a new city, you have to trust leadership to one person who's entirely good and can be trusted. Authority rests in the hands of a good ruler, and it, you might call this person a benevolent dictator. If you live in free city, you have to trust yourself to make the right decisions as well as your neighbors to make decisions for you. The authority rests in the hands of many, many little rulers. So the question is, which city do you choose? 
whether you realize it or not, we make this choice every day of one of these two cities. New city is a short description of God's city or New Jerusalem. There, God is worshipped. God is at the center. Other people are loved. And it's like, like my magic band. We get there and we got the, we got the freedom that we're taken care of. And, and we, it, the, the account's been paid already ahead of time by the blood of Jesus. We don't have to worry about anything of that. We don't have to worry about working and striving and all this stuff. We can do that. We get a new name when we get to that city. And we're free to be who God created us to be. This is, this is heaven. Free city is a short description of life apart from God at the center. Here God is not the center, but the individual is. Here people can live apart from each other. Here people can go home at the end of a day, drive through their gated driveway and go into their house and do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. They have their own space, and they can be free of who they're created to be, escaping a little bit like Walt Disney had in mind for people when they come to Disney World. You, they can, at this city, they can put on the masks, the social media faces that hide who they really are. C- free city, you know by now, is hell. And we choose, the thing is, we choose, you and I, people, we choose hell every day. And that's why this topic today, this theme today, is so critical in this series. Let's read this together, please. I believe there is a heaven and a hell and that Jesus will return to judge all people and to establish his eternal kingdom. You know, it's fairly safe to say that we all can agree with this, this statement. But what we believe about heaven and hell, probably not so much that we all agree. I say that because you might be still hung on the statement I just made. Remember that we all choose hell every day. And you might be wondering, how in the world, what are you talking about, Tim? How do we choose hell every day? I mean, on the surface, it doesn't make any sense at all to choose hell over heaven, does it? I mean, who in their right mind would want to choose that, would choose the hellish things like beatings, like child abuse, like sex trafficking and genocide as part of their world? Who would choose lying and cheating and manipulation and anger and lust and greed? Who would choose any of those things? Who would want any to choose hell over heaven, no one would want to do that. And why would a good ruler put anyone in hell for all eternity? And, you know, that seems to be, if you get down to questioning people, whether you're a follower of Jesus, Christian, or, or not, that seems to be the, the big thing is, why does God send people to hell? Ever, ever, ever heard that one, you know? Why would he do all those things? And it doesn't mesh with having a good father. In fact, there's people who, because of that, subscribe to the annihilation theory, which I'm not, it's way too big for me to get into this sermon. But there's some people that subscribe to that, say, no, God doesn't put anybody in hell for all of eternity. Annihilation theory basically is they're burned up with fire, then they're done with. That's it. So let's, I I thought, you know, probably the best way to to, to look at this is to take a quick look at what the Bible says. So we're going to go start with Genesis. Let's go to the beginning of time is the best place to look at it. In Genesis 1, 1. Um, the beginning, God created what? Heaven and earth, didn't he? God created heaven and earth. So in the Bible, as you look at the scriptures, there's this relationship of heaven and earth. In fact, in the Bible, there's over 200 verses and throughout the entire Bible where heaven and earth are found together. Heaven and earth, heaven and earth. Keep that in mind. In the beginning, everything was good. In the beginning of God's plan, everything was right. Everything was just. Everything was good. And then heaven and earth are torn apart by sin. All this happens, amazing thing in the Bible, it all happens in the first three chapters of the Bible. You only get three chapters into the entire book, and it's ruined. Three little chapters, and it's ruined. Sin wasn't part of God's creation plan. It was an intrusion into God's good creation. God's authority has been denied, and things changed. We have thistles and thorns. We have to work by the sweat. Adam blames Eve. Cain kills Abel. And by the time Noah shows up in the Bible, the whole earth is filled with violence, and God wants to do away with it and start all over again. 
And you know what's amazing? By the time Noah shows up, we're only six chapters into the Bible. And we wonder about the violence in the world today. We wonder about bombs crashing into buildings and killing people. We wonder about police being shot in the back by snipers. We wonder about all this other junk that's in the news today, how violent it is. And the earth was so violent back there, God wanted to do away with the whole thing and start over again. That's a hellish world to live in. And it's a hellish world that we do live in today. We can't help but look at how it's happening. But understand, it didn't come from God. God didn't create hell. You're not going to like this, but this is the reality. We created hell. We created hell. And I'm just going to let you think about that for just a moment here. You and I and those before us created hell. Hellish behavior came when we decided to do it our way instead of God's way. That's when it happened. And God's given free choice. He's let people try to. He let, gave angels free choice. Sin separated Adam and Eve at that time. Did you ever have somebody accuse you of something? Point a finger at you? You know, this is what they say. If you point a finger, be careful. There's three pointing back at you. That's why we do this. <laughs> you know, this one gets the people on the side just in case. You know? <laughs> but, but ever have somebody accuse you of something and it probably felt like hell that you're going through? Ever have somebody get angry at you? I, I talked with a person today or this week. I think I shared this one tonight. I've talked to a person who is not a follower of Jesus, not a Christian, and was just sharing with me about a person, another person that they just couldn't forgive. They said there's no way they will forgive. I said, well, you know, and they were talking about the Bible and stuff, and they knew I was a pastor, obviously, and, and said, you know, I said, you know, in the end of the Lord's Prayer, because most people understand the Lord's Prayer, and I said, at the end of that, Jesus says that you will be forgiven as you forgive other people. And... He said, well, I guess I'm not going to heaven then, just like it didn't matter. And I'm just going, oh, no, you don't get it. And I, I guess I shouldn't expect him to get it, but he just, it just blew my mind away that this person was so caught up in holding on to unforgiveness and anger. That, that, and it was a terrible thing that had happened, don't get me wrong, but, but just holding on to that, and it just grows into this beast that starts eating people alive from the inside out, this anger and resentment and unforgiveness. And, you know, and this person was selecting hell over heaven. And this person could say that he's been put through hell because of what happened, but he wants to make sure he's putting somebody else through hell at the same time. Ever been gossiped about? Let me just tell you something. If you want to gossip about me, that's perfectly fine. Just make it big enough so it's worth my time. <laughs> Say Tim robbed a bank. Do something, you know, to make it worth my time. But it feels like hell when you find out somebody's been talking about you. James said, talked about this. James wrote about this. He said, the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. And people understand that these behaviors have no place in the kingdom of God. But somehow they found a place in us. Hell gains entrance into this world through you and me. And the problem is we don't see it. We see it in other people. That's why we point the finger. We see it in other people, all right, but we don't see it. We want to get rid of genocide. We want to get rid of world hunger. We want to get rid of all sorts of of evil that is out in the world. And we see those things in other people. We see those things in bad people, what they do. But those things exist. And understand, because of lust and anger and greed, and those things are in us too. Yeah, I don't see anybody here getting some C4 and starting to playing a bomb. But we have anger and greed and other issues, don't we? And any discussion about heaven and hell has to start with understanding that we're talking about something that's pretty close to home because we know about it. And the problem in our world, that problems that exist in our world that even non-believers want to get rid of are problems that originate in you and me. They start with us. 
And the playing field is all level. Paul said in Romans 3, he says, none is righteous, no, not one. And then later on 323, he says, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. That's everybody, believer, unbeliever, everybody's in that camp. Yeah, hell is something we don't want. But we choose it every day when we choose to do what we want instead of choosing to do what God wants. Isn't that what we're choosing? We choose it every day when we let anger get have its way. We choose it every day when we let a, our own greed and gluttony and lust and other things take hold of us and have their own way. Understand that when we talk about hell, so often we talk about heaven and hell as though they're counterparts. But did you know that in the Bible, there are zero times in the Bible when the words heaven and hell are used in the same sentence? You can't find it. I looked. And if you find it, please let me know, because I, I got a real fancy Bible on my computer. I got some, you know, ran up through the database, and I could not find heaven and hell in the same sentence. You can find heaven and earth, but you don't find heaven and hell. God creates heaven and earth. You and I, we create, humans create hell. And that's the story of the Bible. But there's good news. In this story, there's a third chapter. The third chapter is the good news. So open your Bibles, if you would, to the last book of the Bible. I started you in Genesis. Go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, if you would, please. Here we find that there's another city. That's the New Jerusalem. And Revelation pictures heaven as a new Jerusalem. It's a place where God is. Right, it's right before the book of uh, right before the book of of uh, index or maps, I guess it is. So if you get the maps, you're too far. Um, here's what it says. This is John the Revelator saying, "And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Understand, it's coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice." From the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell. He will live among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among the people. Isn't that going to be a great day when you think about that? God will be among the people in his city. It's not going to be a nebulous person out there in the cosmos someplace that we pray to. No, he's there. Jesus is there. And it's going to be a great and glorious day. God lives inside the city with his people. He's their God. He's their ruler. He's the center of the worship. That jump, jump down to 22, verse 22. And it says, and I saw no temple in it. Why? For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. There's no need to get into a temple building anymore. God and Jesus are the temple. It's cities where the inhabitants want to be. It's a city where the inhabitants want to live there. They want to be there. They came not on their terms. They come on God's terms. They've been clothed in Christ, not on their own attempts of being good and doing right things. They want to worship him. They want to live in his city. And the wonderful thing is that everyone is invited to live in the new Jerusalem. Look at this. In the daytime, verse 25, in the daytime, for there will be no nighttime there. It's like Alaska, right? No. <laughs> its gates will never be closed. There's no need to keep the people out. It's always open. Everybody is invited and welcome. Almost everybody. There are a few people that can't come in. And it says this in verse 27. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so the question is. We understand about people's names were being written in the Lamb's book of life, but what about the people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life? And the answer is pretty simple. They go to live in another place, and that place is called hell. No matter who tells you that there's no hell, I'm sorry, they're wrong. They're, they're wrong. That's a, that's a great deception of Satan to say there is no hell. 
Satan is deceiving people today, saying there is no hell, because there is a hell. Where God lives inside the city with his people, hell exists outside the city. So often we think of heaven as up there and hell is down there, but that is wrong. That's not the bad theology. The Bible doesn't teach about heaven up and, and hell is down. The heaven is actually coming to earth here. We see heaven come crashing, to New Jerusalem is crashing into earth and being one. In Revelation, we find that the New Jerusalem is coming, it says, coming down out of heaven. And God created heaven and earth, and he's reconnecting them at the end of the story, just like at the beginning. At the beginning in, in, in um, Genesis, we see Adam and Eve, and there was a, the trees, two trees in the garden, the garden of tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? And what Adam and Eve do, they, they eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and God in his mercy says, I'm going to get you out of here. I'm going to guard this entrance so you don't come back in and eat of the tree of life because if you do, you'll live forever and have to live with what you've done forever. And so he gets kicks them out. And then at the end of the Bible, and you go read in, Je in Revelation here, 22, you'll see that there's a tree in heaven, and it's the tree of life. So we have the tree of life at the beginning. We have the tree of life at the end. And the question is, you and I have to live in between the two trees. So God, what he has done at the beginning, wants to recreate that at the end. And he brings heaven to earth to join earth. But what separated them? The people, earth and heaven, cannot be found in the new city. God has nothing to do with sin. All the evil, all the lying, all the cheating, all the abuse, all the murders, all the drugs, all the idolatry, all the lust, all the violence, all the greed, and the list goes on. Or people who want to live on their own terms instead of living on God's terms are left outside the city. And Jesus calls that place hell. And let me show you. Hell was actually a physical place to Jesus. He understood that. But the Greek word for hell is Gehenna. Ge means valley. Henna means Hinnom. Hinnom Valley. And there, there are people, when they, they read this, they read the Bible, they said, no, when he was using this word, he was talking about something else. He wasn't talking about an actual place. But let me, let me take you back. Um, the Valley of Hinnom shows up in the Old Testament many times. And it was known for two things. One thing it was known for is a place of idolatry. It is a place where people would go and defile themselves with foreign gods. They would take up the children of Israel, people and judges in our Wednesday night. Children of Israel would take in these strangers and they take in their idols and they defile themselves and start worshiping these idols. And they practice, do the religious practices of the neighbors. And the other thing it was known for is a place of injustice. Israelites would go there and sacrifice their children. They would kill their children and, and they'd have child sacrifice at this place. The Valley of Hinnom was a place then where people chose to forsake God, turn their back from God, who were cruel, who were unjust to each other. And fires would be lit there by the people themselves in the act of devotion and worship of false gods. Fast forward to the New Testament time in Jesus' time where Gehenna is mentioned 12 times in the New Testament, 11 times in, er, in the Gospels. And one example would be in Matthew 18, where Jesus is talking about teaching children and receiving them and not treating them well. And then he goes on to say this. He says, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out, throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. And the word hell there is Gehenna. And so the disciples, when Jesus is talking about, they know what he's talking about. It was a cruel, it was an unjust place to be. And if somebody wanted to be with God, this is not the place you'd want to be. They knew about it from the Hebrew background. They knew about it from the prophets. But they also knew that it is another place. And this is where people kind of try to separate things. They also knew it as a city dump. Here's a picture of, of uh, Jerusalem, the upper city, the Essene Quarter, the lower city, and all that stuff. Here is the Hinnom Valley. And as legend has, as stories have, tradition has, I should say, the all the trash from Jerusalem would be taken out into the Hinnom Valley, and it would be burnt. And so there's this constant odor, there's this constant burning from what's going on, from all the garbage, all that smelling. You could smell the ruins, you could smell the refuse, and all that stuff. It was never ending. And Jesus was saying that the sin that, that keeps us from being with God 
needs to be burned. It's worthless. It will hinder our lives. Life was inside Jerusalem, death outside the walls. Please understand, when Jesus uses terms like this, he's trying to get people to understand. You know, when he uses terms like or this, he's not saying it actually is, this is hell. I mean, people, I've had people say, there's no such thing as hell. He's talking about this, and it meant the place they burn trash, so hell doesn't really exist. I'm sorry, but you have it wrong. Go to your Greek, go to your Hebrew, and you'll find the different things. At any rate, let me get excited about this stuff. Jeez. Anyway, so, and so contrary to what we think, hell is not down there. It's out there, and it's in here. And God wants to get the hell out of earth and us. So he assigns evil a place to be, and it's called hell, and he contains it there. And he contains it there in hell, evil in hell, for two reasons. One is he wants to protect the people who live inside the city, who are with him, and he's the ruler of the city. He wants to protect them. Evil cannot create as God does, but it does corrupt. Satan cannot create anything like God does. He mimics and he corrupts. It only corrupts all that God creates. It always wants to invade the space that God has created. Evil is like like a parasite. A parasite can only live off of something else that's good and better and, 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 and goes through uh, what God created. So God protects his people in the New Jerusalem by not allowing them to have any contact with the unclean and detestable things. That cannot come into the New Jerusalem. But he also contains hell because of his mercy. In the Pilgrim's Progress, T.S. Lewis wrote this. It is the landlord's last service to those who will let him do nothing better for them. It's God's way of putting a limit on the harm of those people who refuse to do it God's way and the harm they might do to themselves. That's what sin does. It harms creation. It harms relationships. It's lustful. It's violent. It's greedy. Sin on its own will always get worse. It never gets better. So God contains it out of his mercy to people. It's like someone who cuts her arm badly. And it's bleeding. Tendons are cut. Whatever, whatever's in there is cut. Yeah. So <laughs> I know tendons are in there, right? Ligaments. And anyway, they go in there. They come. Jeff's at the ER, and they come in, and, and he says, we're going to need surgery to put those things back together. No, 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 no. Just bandage it up and let me go. Jeff has to, he tries to talk him into it. No, 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 just bandage it up, let me go. And Jeff has to do what they want. If that's really what they want, you can't make them have surgery. And so they go on their way. Now, we might say that that was mean of Jeff to do that. He shouldn't have done it. No, no. Jeff wanted to fix it the right way, but he couldn't because they didn't want it fixed the right way. They just wanted a bandage on it. They didn't, they didn't want to have it done right. Which brings me back to two cities. In one, there's healing for people who know they need it. And in the other, there's, there are those who need healing but don't want it. Just put a bandage on it let me go. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. As a gentleman, God always keeps his word. And for those whose heart's desire is to live separated from God, to not receive a healing touch, and to live in a self-centered life, he gives them what they desire. He's not going to make anybody, force anybody to come into his city. God does not torture people. He does not send anybody to hell. People choose to go to hell. Choose to stay live separate from what God's plans are. And so he hands them over to their own desire to live outside the city forever. But inside the city, there's light. For those people who, whose desire is to delight in him will live there forever. As um, I'm a chaplain on the Garfield Township Fire Department, um, got a call yesterday and I went to a house to find that someone had committed suicide. And so I, I walk up, and there's a person laying there, and the spouse 
is crying over them, obviously, and it's just distraught. It's a difficult situation. And, and I just thought, you know, I wonder if this person knew Jesus. I wonder, you know, it's, it's one thing to have a disease that you can prepare yourself for. And I don't know what goes through the head of somebody committing suicide. I don't know any of that. I just know that those things are awful and terrible things. And I wonder, did they know Jesus? Did they know whatever? Did they have a hope of living in the city one day? We can, we can make it through difficult times because we have a hope. We have a hope of something better that's out there. We don't have to live in this old earth is fading. And our hearts are aching that God will make all things new. You heard the song? You sang the song? What do you choose? What's your city? You have to start preparing life today for the new Jerusalem tomorrow. Over the next 10 weeks, we're going to be looking at the practices of those people who want to live with God, how, what it means to be a follower and how to do that. But for now, you and I can have hope in the future. If you don't know Jesus and don't have that hope, understand, you can let the God who can heal you get the hell out of you. You just have to do that. And today you've got a choice to make. We all make the same choice today and every day. Which city is it? Free city or new city? I'm going to let you decide. Father God, you've given us...